Our next topic is pulmonary artery hypertension in ICU by Dr. Dilip Raman. He is founding partner of Cloud Physician Services Limited, a Bangalore-based startup with expertise in tele-ICU, pulmonary and sleep medicine. Uh, while we are loading the uh, presentation, I just want to uh, thank everyone for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's very hard to follow a talk like that. And uh, I, I really uh, want to thank Dr. Dam. I don't know you personally, but uh, whatever you said is uh, on a personal level and a professional level very close to uh, what we do as intensivists. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that that's this change that uh, we badly need in India to die with dignity, to die with, de uh, you know, in the arms of our loved ones sometimes. There are strange rules that happen in our ICUs where family members are not allowed to come into the ICU when uh, patients are dying. And I think this needs to change gradually. And I'm just happy to be in your presence uh, to uh, see that change happen in real time. So I just want to thank you. Okay, so my talk is going to center around what we call pulmonary hypertension in the ICU. Uh, why am I talking on this? I'm a pulmonologist. I'm a, I do intensive care. I do some sleep. The weird thing is, I'm still waiting for it to load, so I'll make a few more words. Um, in, in, in where I trained in the US, it's the pulmonary guys who manage pulmonary hypertension. So uh, in India, it's usually the cardiologists who do the heart cath, who manage the pulmonary hypertension cases, and they have longitudinal follow-up of these patients, which is a good thing. Uh, in the US, the system is different. I'm sure it's different in different continents on how you practice. It doesn't bear on, on how uh, you manage the patient. But in some ways, it's important to have a continuum. So when you're a pulmonary guy, you'll see a lot of lung diseases. And then pulmonary hypertension is usually secondary to that. And, and again, you, ha you have a continuum. If your population is predominantly left heart disease, and you get pulmonary hypertension from that, it's a different continuum. But what this talk is going to uh, help you figure out is that the word PAH is completely different from uh, the word PH, which is pulmonary hypertension. And what we have to figure out is decide which subtype of pulmonary hypertension you're going to deal with, how you can treat it, and just like non-maleficence applies to, uh, uh, to palliative care, it applies to general medicine as well, do no harm. Pulmonary hypertension is one of those diseases that is uh, fatal. And if you don't do things in a certain manner, you can cause harm quicker than you would believe. And I'll share a few uh, stories as we go along. So with that backdrop, uh, let me proceed without further ado. No disclosures, it's a mandatory slide. Uh, definitions and terminology, it's important, like I was trying to you know, get across to you. Pulmonary hypertension just means you have a high blood pressure in your pulmonary vessels. The mean PA pressure would be over 25 uh, milliliters of merc millimeters of merc mercury at rest. But pulmonary arterial hypertension is a completely different beast. So whenever you guys are using this, please be careful about the terminology. When someone comes and tells me pulmonary arterial hypertension, I assume that they have done all the necessary workup to come to that diagnosis. So for me, pulmonary hypertension is completely different from pulmonary arterial hypertension. Pulmonary arterial hypertension to me is a fatal disease. It's a disease that affects young people. It's a disease that requires intensive testing, workup, and medications to prolong life. Without those medications, the mortality is uh, very high in the first two to three years, 80 to 90 percent without therapy. So when you say pulmonary hypertension, the game's open. There are a large amount of diseases that you need to rule out before we progress. So that's the outset. And for pulmonary arterial hypertension, you need to have the same criteria as pulmonary hypertension. Plus, you have to rule out left heart disease. There are a lot of ways to do that. I know there are echo fans here, and we'll address that. And you have to have what's known as an elevated transpulmonary gradient, meaning a high pressure gradient between the two circuits uh, across the pulmonary uh, vasculature. So that's, that's the terminology. And when I say pulmonary arterial hypertension, I mean something very specific in particular. 
This is a, a long favorite uh, PA catheter diagram. I, just a quick review so that uh, we understand what we're talking about as the lecture progresses. It's, you can, the blue one is the catheter that represents you going from the uh, great vessels to the RA, then to the RV, to the pulmonary artery, and then wedging in a smaller vessel with inflating the balloon. You can see the uh, pressure wave as it goes, as you inflate the balloon towards the end. The pulmonary arterial wedge pressure or occlusion pressure is right there at the end. Just a basic review. This is what you use for standard of care in diagnosing pulmonary arterial hypertension. So if someone comes to you with pulmonary arterial hypertension and they don't have a heart cath, you have to think twice because they may not be on the correct care path for that disease. For pulmonary hypertension, you don't need a heart cath. But if you want to diagnose pulmonary arterial hypertension and give the patient the best chance of quality of life, they need to go through a certain diagnostic pathway. Because treatment is expensive and you don't want to unnecessarily treat these patients with expensive and uh, expensive drugs that have a lot of side effects. So do it right the first time. Some basic formulae, this is probably well known to those guys who are practicing in the ICU. And we'll go to the offshoots of this in the uh, operating room um, if time permits. But this is predominantly about pulmonary hypertension in the ICU. So resistance in any, any formula is pressure difference time divided by flow. So systemic vascular resistance is the pressure difference across the circuit. So uh, mean um, atrial pressure by, I mean, mean arterial pressure minus the right atrial pressure divided by the cardiac output. And if you multiply, if you don't multiply by AT, you end up with what's called as wood units. So the normals, um, you'll see that the PVR should be less than three wood units or less than 120 dynes. Um, and in pH, 240 is the cutoff because there's a gray zone between 120 and 240 that we don't know what to do with. Uh, it's still a controversial area of active research. And then you have the transpulmonary gradient, which is the difference across the entire pulmonary bed. And it looks at uh, what's called as out of proportion pulmonary hypertension. So what's important here is um, you'll have a lot of patients who have mixed pathologies. So you have, they'll have COPD, they'll have a little bit of heart failure, they may have some sleep apnea. When you see this patient and you look at their RV when you're doing the echo, you say, okay, fine, the RV is a little dilated, the LV is working okay, the BNP is normal, does this guy have pulmonary hypertension? The possible answer is they probably have pulmonary hypertension, but they may not have pulmonary arterial hypertension. And only when you do a right heart cath will you know um, where they are. So everybody says obstructive sleep apnea can lead to core pulmonary. Everybody says that COPD can lead to core pulmonary. That actually, when you look at the clinical data, is less than 10% or even 5% of the time. Severe pulmonary hypertension does not happen with lung disease. It does not happen with sleep apnea. All you get is a mild to moderate. They don't die from it. It's a bad prognostic marker, but in two years, they won't be dead. So if you have a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension and sleep apnea, please don't attribute it to sleep apnea. Look for something else. There's something else going on. Either there's combined heart disease or another lung disease, or they may have underlying pulmonary arterial hypertension, a genetic disorder. So that is very important to understand. That's what I meant by out of proportion pH. So in your pre-op patients, when you're reviewing them and you're trying to risk stratify them, when you see that your pre-op echo, don't just jump to saying that's pulmonary arterial hypertension. That's the wrong thing to do. Because if you have a PAH patient and you take them to the OR and they die, there are questions. Why did you take a PA, pulmonary arterial hypertension patient, without further risk stratification straight to the OR when you know that their on-table mortality can be high? Now, if you don't make the diagnosis of PAH and you just think it's a pulmonary hypertension, totally different ball game, different risk category. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll elucidate that and reinforce that point as we go on. So the gradient should be less than 12. This is a you know, standard classification by Semino started with the Dana point classification in the 70s. All that you guys will need to know is group one is a diagnosis of exclusion. And that's the PAH part that I was trying to stress on. That's the danger group. So if you're looking for a patient that wants to die on the table when you give one liter of saline bolus, that's the patient that's going to have a problem. When you want to look for a patient who has a bad outcome right after intubation, you intubate a patient, they suddenly code, they have an arrest, the patient that does that is the group one patient. They go into acute RV ischemia and an RV MI about 15 minutes after intubation. You've seen it a bunch of times. I'll show you how it works, but it happens. The other groups are generally um, 
more benign I want to say. PH is always a bad actor. It's a villain in the movie where we are the Joker, right? So, but, but the villain can come in different ways. You can have a comic villain. You can have a really evil guy. Group 1 is the one you want to watch out for. So PH due to left heart disease, PH due to um, lung, chronic lung disease, again just pulmonary hypertension, that's group 3. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension is group 4. Group 5 is a wastebasket diagnosis. Every time this conference meet, they put different people in the wastebasket and take different people out. There's no need to keep tag of all that, but it's important to know, know that these classifications keep changing. And I'll tell you what is important on the echo and on your clinical uh, predictors to be careful about. Now, there's a huge buzz in the ICU um, about RV protective strategies of not just RV protection during ventilation, but also RV protection during your fluid boluses, how you use your medications, how to use digoxin, calcium channel blockers, mildrenone, all these fancy drugs that you have, how do you use them in a safe manner? So, you know, pulmonary hypertension happens in the ICU all the time. Every time you have ARDS, it's extremely likely that a large chunk of your patient population that you're dealing with will have some RV overload, uh, uh, RV um, strain. That RV strain is not necessarily due to like a clot or another pathology. It could be just because of the hypoxic, uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction that's causing acute core pulmonary. Remember the RV is a very simple, uh, soft, thin muscular bag. It doesn't take stress too well. Acute stress, it can't handle really well. If you give chronic stress over time, the RV can cope and compensate, and, and, and it builds up, uh, builds up enough uh, resilience to last longer. But eventually, it will fail if you keep troubling it. So acute carpal pulmonary affects mortality because the acute strain of ARDS um, cannot be withstood, withstood, uh, withstood by the RV that's not designed to handle acute pressure loads. So this is a common clinical scenario. You've got two spectra. One, you have a clear x-ray with a large heart, and then you have a fuzzy heart with a fuzzy x-ray. There's, there's a paradigm to deal with both of these things. The echo not, is helpful, lung ultrasound is helpful, and chest x-ray is just the historic context. These days, I think I would use lung ultrasound in a far more effective way to come to the same conclusion. But looking at this, you guys would have uh, an idea on, on what to do. You have a wet lung, so you're probably going to give some non-invasive. You're going to give something to reduce the preload and afterload. Nitrates are wonderful in this regard. Uh, I'm talking about the high-dose nitrate protocols, you know, where you use 400 micrograms rather than the uh, pediatric doses. Works well. This is something, the, the image on, uh, on this side, the ARDS or heart failure image is something you guys are all familiar with. It's not a, it's not a suspense. There's increased LV pressure, there's back pressure, and then your lungs fill up. The other end, you could have a clear lung, which could be COPD, but astute observers will note that here the RV is enlarged and the pulmonary artery is massive. This is not plain COPD. This is COPD with pulmonary artery hypertension. Pulmonary artery hypertension. You're, you're going towards the high-risk terminology here. And why I say that is that we've, this, these kind of patients, when you do a heart cath on them, they have uh, poor prognostic markers. Their cardiac output is less than two, cardiac index is less than two, I'm sorry. On their echo, their septum is bulging, there's a D shape, which I'll show you. But, but two totally different patients. The first one, you can afford a little bit of uh, luxury. If you, even if you make a few mistakes here and there, the patient generally does fine. But the other one, you need to be careful. So is there pulmonary hypertension? You look at the x-ray, the echo, it gives you early clues, but they're not diagnostic. Yesterday, I was having a discussion with uh, one of the docs about uh, during the ventilation uh, workshop as to you know, how to be careful about these PH patients and, and what does the RVSP mean? You know, the e echo report comes RVSP 80, severe PH, you know, this guy is done. You know, the echo, you got to take it with a grain of salt. It is not diagnostic, first. Second, the RVSP alone does not prognosticate the patient. A high RVSP is not telling you that the patient's going to die. There are other factors you need to look at. So the people who use the RVSP, 80, 60, 40 cutoff, it's a little unscientific. You're doing a lot of coin tossing there to figure out what's important and what's not. So I urge caution on using the ECHO RVSP alone as a prognostic criteria. So I'm going to tell you what all clues to look for in the ECHO and to read between the lines. The cardiologist will scribble something, but you've got to go and look for that. If you are worried about your on-table mortality, even call that guy and ask him, hey, 
you said the RVSP is 80 but what about the wall motion what about the RV diameter what about the RV function what about the septum how is it moving is it uh, is it having a paradoxical movement what about the TR um, jet so these are some of the things that you need to ask because RVSP alone is not useful so that's another take-home thing that I would remember don't rely on that one number alone um, you know group 3 like I was telling is usually mild to moderate so if you see a patient with COPD and you see mild pulmonary hypertension yeah do some general you know safeguards but there's not a whole lot to worry if their RV function is okay that means in your on your surgery table they'll be able to handle a fluid load and we'll come to the fluid load uh, uh, load later but that's just a, a prelim point um, always think about DVTs and uh, CTEF CTEF is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary artery hypertension it's rare but if you guys ever come across it in, in you know from a pH guys perspective it is the one disease that you should probably let the team know and tell them how serious this is once you know that the patient could have a thromboembolic form of pulmonary hypertension it's the only one that's curable by surgery that, that of all the other five types they're all chronic diseases long term they need sometimes IV drugs PO drugs there's a high mortality but CTEF if you send them to the, to the right center the outcome is actually pretty good there are places in India that are doing a good job uh, I know a few places in Cochin I think Chennai also does good work uh, with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension they need to be at a good center if they have to have a good quality of life generally these patients are young so it's worth doing something right for them so if you guys are the first line people to encounter this guy with uh, thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension he needs more than just a post-op care he needs someone to actually take care of him long term so that he survives not just beyond your OT but you know in life in general so you might be the first guys to see this because if they have a pre-op echo and you're reviewing them keep an eye on these guys they get frequently missed so in the ICU when you come back with uh, your patient what what are the consequences and how does it interplay with what's happening in the ICU 60% of your medical ICU patients are are generally having some kind of lung dysfunction so hypoxia is both the result and a cause of pulmonary arterial, arterial hypertension and pulmonary hypertension in general acute hypoxia will not cause severe because if it causes severe the patient would die remember I told you the RV can't handle severe pH so it has to be a gradual process for hypoxia alone to cause severe pH so it will be hypoxia coupled with something else fluid overload ARDS um, maybe another couple of factors like uh, sepsis induced cardiomyopathy happens 30 percent of the time so you have both LV RV dysfunction and then you get a combined severe uh, pulmonary hypertension and RV failure good perfusion will give you more liberty to tweak your PEEP to avoid the hypoxia so it's going to be a balance between hypoxia and PEEP titration when you have RV problems and fluid balance fluid assessment is crucial it's easier said than done if you had another speaker here we could debate all day on how to figure out what's the right fluid to give in an RV failing uh, in a patient with a failing RV so I, I'll just leave it that you got to assess the fluid carefully how you do it is probably another lecture and a little bit more difficult but there are tools at hand you've got dynamic tools like looking at the arterial waveform by giving fluid challenges anyone who does liver transplants uh, do you do liver transplants with portopulmonary hypertension cases okay so how many would you have done in the last year less than one percent you yeah. know the number so it's most of fluid overload once taken care of it you know generally settles down. that's right so I'll give you an extreme example back when we were in training portal pulmonary hypertension was last a two minutes left sorry last two minutes left yes portal pulmonary hypertension was a comp uh, contraindication uh, but nowadays with drugs that is changing so more and more people you can actually push through liver transplant and they do fluid challenges to uh, assess that so you can do these dynamic things to figure out whether your patient can tolerate it or not so in the interest of time we'll move on this is a f you know a, a diagram to show you that when you increase your positive pressure you will increase the RV afterload that is the key problem here in the ICU and that's what we got to address this is another favorite uh, people who do echoes would have seen this uh, D-shaped LV that's pressure overload the RV large thing there pushing over to the LV this is what you want to ask the cardiologist same thing here uh, the RV is a little different from the LV if you look at the pressure uh, relationship of the LV it can tolerate a lot more 
the RV is actually not a small LV, it's a completely different physiological organ and it can't tolerate these uh, pressure volume overloads as well as the LV can. So th these are the differences, but the core thing you need to understand is that the RV is better adapted to volume overload than pressure overload. Um, can skip this. This is what I was trying to show. This is actually a sleep study. Why am I showing you a sleep study? Because even at the, in the out outpatient setting, you can see, you look at the pleth, the lowest thing that's highlighted by the red is the plethysmographic signal. And we put this patient on ASV. Look what positive pressure does to this guy. Each time the ventilator ramps up the pressure, the cardiac output drops. You can do this in your ICU. You can, I was talking to you about this yesterday during the vent lectures, you can change your cardiac output and you can see the drop in cardiac output with your plethysmographic signal, your arterial waveform. So if you don't have a pulmonary arterial catheter, do this. Increase your PEEP, see how much the arterial waveform drops and you can say, man, this guy is a little bit dangerous on pulmonary hypertension, let's be careful. So you don't need a heart cath all the time, although that's preferred. So. RV functional evaluation is a balance like I was telling you. You have to balance the recruitment, you have to balance over inflation. Remember just the core principles. S few ground rules. Don't start sildenafil and ET1 uh, antagonists off the front just based on the RVSP. Look at the function and then do it. Be careful about pH specific drugs. Uh, how to assess going beyond the echo, we already talked about that. And these are some of the uh, basic things that you can look on for severity. Note, RVSP is nowhere in the list. Nobody looks at RVSP. If you go to a center that does pH, that's what they look at. Functional outcome. Six-minute walk test is cheap. Learn how to do it if you're doing a PAC for a pH patient. You walk them for six minutes and see how much they can walk. It doesn't get more simple than that. So you can, you can figure out what their risk uh, stratification is with that. RA pressure, you put a central line, you got it. So maybe you can avoid doing the other more difficult ones that I'm showing in the table, but the point is that RVSP that everyone likes to hang their hat on is not that critically important. Care and establish pH, maintain perfusion, avoid intubation. I was telling you, the moment you intubate, they get an RV afterload bump, they go into RV ischemia, and typically the ones that I see, if they have severe pH, there's a high chance for uh, CPR in about 30 to 40 minutes after intubation. So to avoid that, you can actually start them on a, on a presser before you decide to intubate. So when you're in the OR, even if they don't have hypertension, start the norepinephrine drip. It sounds weird, maybe it's giving a bad sign, but in cases with RV dysfunction, it's probably the best thing you're doing for the patient. Give them enough fluid to load them so that they don't go into uh, preload dependent failure. And then be careful about norepinephrine. The hypotension in RV failing patients after you institute the ventilator is quick and rapid. You'll not in have enough time to recover. Again, it's worse in the PAH group. So fluid overload is statistically more common. So if they come to your ICU first, you can try and diurese them. That's 80% of the time they're fluid overloaded. Only 20% of these patients when they come to the ICU are they dry. Mildenone, levosimendan, I'm not a huge fan. You can try them. If you're trying any agent in pH, make sure it's a short-acting agent. If you want to give metoprolol, try esmolol. It is safer and you'll do less harm. And in case you screw up, you can always go back. So try and avoid using the long-acting ones. I know it's easier to say, but if you are dealing with a lot of pH patients and you see them more frequently, you should probably stock those kind of drugs with you uh, rather than not. Anyway, I don't think we should use beta blockers in RV failing patients, but if you have to, use short-acting stuff. A lot of people advocate doburamine. It increases both RV oxygen demand, causes tachycardia. Both things are bad in a failing RV. So again, be very cautious. Try not to exceed a dose of more than 5 to 10. More than 10 generally causes mm -hmm. hypotension due to beta 2 stimulation. So if you must use it, stick to a low dose. Sir, you are overshooting the thing. All right, we're almost done. Putting it all together. So uh, limit th these things. Keep the plateau pressure less than 27. Driving pressure less than 17, limit your PCO2. These are all RV protective strategies. So if you have to take anything home, this is it. Try to avoid uh, routine drugs. All right, any questions? Almost on time. Right? Do we have time for questions or is that, did I swallow that? That we can ask for, we can ask you now. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, Facebook. One, one right, question fine. from Dr. Aparna, she's saying. Sure. 
Dr. Raman, it was an excellent uh, lecture, very informative, and maybe in the um, coming future, I will look forward to a more detailed lecture from you. Sure. So one question is, uh, you were talking about clinical assessment of uh, pulmonary pressures, hmm. pulmonary hypertension, and you talked about uh, six-minute walk test. Yeah. You know, so when there is uh, obesity-induced uh, sleep apnea, morbidly obese or super super morbidly obese patients who hardly have any physical activity, they're very exercise limited. You know, and if they go for an echo, they don't even get a window for doing the echo. You need so, uh, for and that, so yeah. what clinical indicators uh, you would suggest, and what investigations? Because you can't subject every patient to an angio and you know to, right uh, to go yeah. for the thing. Yeah. So how do you think the clinical assessment should be done? Yeah. So uh, it's a very loaded question because you know a, a bariatric patient, a morbidly obese patient is, uh, is it's completely different physiology. So it's really hard to apply all what I've said for the generic PAH patients to the same. That table that I showed you has been only tested in the PAH group. It has not been tested in any other pulmonary artery hypertension group. So firstly I would say that the obese patients who you think have PAH probably don't have pH, they probably just have pH, right? So if they have pH, you're already starting off at a low risk, low risk uh, mode there. If they're ambulatory, they can still do the six minute walk test. If they're non-ambulatory, there are not many other clinical signs to go f with because the WHO functional classification rests on function. If they are dyspneic at rest in an obese patient, sorry? Yeah, but at the same time, most of them have dyspnea that's multifactorial. Their dyspnea could be just a manifestation of increased airway resistance, Pickwickian syndrome. They could have uh, obesity hyperventilation as well. So they they can they can be the can't breathe or won't breathe phenotype. Two different phenotypes. The pulmonary hypertension component is usually a very very minor deal there. But in those patients, what you can do is you can do a DLCO. If you have the uh, pulmonary expertise to do a DLCO, that is function independent. And generally, patients with severe pulmonary hypertension will have normal PFTs but an abnormal DLCO. And frequently, in, if I am sent a morbidly obese patient for pre-op bariatric care for uh, pulmonary fitness, that's what I go by because they can't do all the other things that I like to do. So DLCO will give you a good, good idea uh -huh. of perfusion with uh, a normal lung. So I use the x-ray, CD scan, echo if possible, and then uh, I look at the DLCO. Okay, I think uh, we could discuss it later, please.